Dice in the Pacific, take two. Yes, I lied. If you watched the other video, I'm uh, redoing this. Perhaps with less profanity and gripes about the tax system. Uh, and my camera and whatnot. I figured out the solution to my camera, which involves folding up a little piece of uh, cardboard and shoving it under the power source. It's gotten loose and the connections are bad. It's going to die soon, so who knows what will happen then. All right, so I'm not going to give a lot of the sort of background information. I gave that in the other video. That will be posted everywhere as, you know, some sort of, I don't know, outtake or something. There is some interesting information at the beginning of that, at the very least. But I do want to skim over the rules of Victory of the Pacific a little quicker because I know some people want that rules introduction. And that's, uh, that's fine. All right. So first of all, this is a game about area, uh, control of this, uh, sea areas on the board. And the way you're going to win this game is each turn you score points based on who you are and whether or not you have a flag in that area. Um, so... You know, the Japanese would get two points for having the flag here, and that's tracked over on this track as a uh, running total. So at the end of each turn, you get points for what you hold on that turn. The allies only get one. You can't really see it because this is a mounted map, and it kind of, you know, has this crevice that hides important information. Uh, what else do we have on the map very briefly? We have... Uh, areas. Now these are, the pink areas are major ports and those are handled a little differently from the green areas which are minor ports or bases. The minor ports and bases can be captured using ground troops. The major ports have to be taken by surrounding them with controlled areas over the course. Uh, you have to start the turn that way and you have to end the turn controlling them. That also works for the minor ports, but sometimes you want to drop a landing force in there, either to scare off enemy planes or uh, just because you can't control. So like at Guadalcanal, you might not be able to control the two areas that uh, dominate it. Oh, what else? Ships, very quickly. Uh, firepower, armor value, movement rate, uh, movement speed. That's important for a couple of things, both distance, you can travel, it's not a number that indicates how many areas, uh, it's just a speed value that you roll against in certain instances. And it's also important for fleeing battle or pursuing. And then aircraft carriers have this additional number up here, which indicates uh, the strength of their airstrikes. Some of the numbers have a white circle on them. That's going to be a bonus in combat. That gives you a plus one on the combat die roll. We'll explain how the combat die rolls work. It's not really a buckets of dice system. I kind of speak of it that way. It was it and its predecessor, uh, War in the Pacific, uh, sorry, War, War at Sea, um, both had so many dice in them that people often called them dice at sea, dice in the Pacific. And I like that term. Uh, I don't like rolling a lot of dice, but this was such an early entry well, at least Warren C was, uh, such an early entry into that kind of idea of, of designs that it probably deserves a little more respect than some of the later games that rely on it. Uh, anything else we've got here? Yeah, we got air, air units, which are rated similar to the naval units. Um, the numbers firepower and then armor, they don't have a speed rating, they have an asterisk instead of that. And then marines, or amphibious troops, which don't have a firepower obviously, but they have the armor and they have a movement rating because they are representing the surface vessels that are carrying the troops when they're not on land. Okay, base flow of the game. Both players are going to get to do movement. Now that movement's kind of pulsed. First the Japanese player gets to move his fleet units uh, to set up to patrol. Now patrolling is an attempt, you want to put them face up like this to patrol. That allows you to maintain, if you have that at the end of the turn, a flag in the area or gain a flag in the area. Remember, flags are how you score your points and it's also the way of converting um, some of the bases. The second uh, so that's the first movement, and first the Japanese does that, 
and then the American does it. And it's two C areas, but if you go a second C area, you have to roll a die for each ship, and you have to get under their speed value, the third number on here, or else they'll flip over, and they're no longer going to count for the flag. Now, all you need to do is have one element, one, one, uh, one ship or patrolling plane in an area to get a flag. Then, uh, after that kind of movement, you hit uh, an alternating placement of land-based air. Land-based air is these guys. Uh, they can only be placed adjacent to a port in a sea area that's adjacent to a port that you control. They will patrol and control the sea area adjacent to that port. So they're a very valuable resource. Uh, Japanese place the first one and the players alternate to do that. Then the third action is moving amphibious units. First the Japanese, then the Americans do so. I believe they can move two areas and they do not have to roll. The final thing is placement of, is movement of um, raiding forces. This gets a little bit weirder. U.S. and Japanese ships can move two areas and be placed face down, raiding, or up to two areas, without a die roll. If they go a third area, they have to roll a die, and if they fail, they have to go home. British and Australians have to roll even on the second area, which opens up some interesting comparisons to whether or not you want to try to put ships out in the patrolling time period when you're kind of telegraphing your move a little earlier, or... And, and you also don't know where all the Japanese raiders are, or if you want to wait until the raiding phase when you still have to roll a die to go two spaces for those particular countries. For the Americans, you're pretty much safe waiting until the raiding phase if you don't want to use those ships for control. All right, that's the simplicity of the movement. Then we get to combat, and the way combat works is you're going to... Uh, the Japanese player picks one sea area at a time to declare we're going to do combat operations. Combat operations will be split into a number of things. The first thing you do is you align the forces. You, you, you have to decide which, uh, whether or not you're going to have a night or a day battle. So each player gets to choose, the Japanese first, which one they want. Uh, if they both pick the same one, that's the one they're going to get. If they pick different ones, then they each roll a die. And you get a plus one on the die roll if you have the control flag for the area. And you get a plus one to the die roll if you're asking for a day battle. Whoever has the higher roller, their choice uh, takes precedence. However, if they end up tying, you end up getting a day battle and a night battle that are essentially at the same time. The night battle is happening during, it's a daytime gunfire battle. Uh, but because you get airstrikes in earlier in general, the day battle will be fought first, but what's important here is combat's going to be fought in multiple rounds, but this counts as a single round of combat in the sense that you don't have an opportunity to disengage in the middle between the day and the night fight. Normally, each round of combat, you get an option to disengage afterwards, which breaks it up into many, many different combats, actually. The way combat actually happens is first the Japanese player declares all the ships that he wants to fire at the allied ships, and he rolls the dice for those. And then the allied player declares all the ships he wants to fire and rolls the dice, but the actual effects are going to be simultaneous. Now the way the dice are rolled, let's say the Prince of Wales is shooting at something, it'll roll four dice because it has a combat factor of four. Every five, well, if it gets a five, it's going to put one of these little X's, which is a damaged marker that indicates that the enemy ship is going to have to return to port before this combat round, uh, right after this combat round, essentially, unless it's sunk. Every six you get does damage, though, and you roll a die for that, and that's how many hit markers you put on a ship. A ship can take a number of hit markers equal to its armor value. The armor value... So each hit that you take lowers your speed of your ship by one. It cannot go lower. I'm gripping sweat because I went outside. It cannot go lower uh, than one, though. You always have a movement fact of speed rating of one. Um, now I'm choking on my brain again. Let's see. Uh, the as soon as my flow of conversation stops, I lose my brain. Okay, uh, 
So, if you manage to match the armor factor on the ship, the ship will have now a firepower rating of one for every subsequent round. If you exceed it, it's sunk. One exception to that is during air raids. We'll get to those briefly. Uh, now, remember there's two kinds of battle. Air, uh, day battle and night battle. Day battles are going to be air power battles. And in those cases, the only things that can attack are uh, your ground-based air and aircraft carrier using their air power value. And that's how many dice you're going to have. And they can attack anything in the enemy force. Basically, nothing's protected. The second type of uh, battle, the night battle, well, only gunfire values are counted. And you can only attack enemy ships that are attacking. With the proviso that if you attack every enemy ship that's attacking, you can attack the other th ships there. You cannot attack air units directly during this period. Um, I think that's basically the brief situation with the combat. A lot of die rolling, but no saves, no, no, no rolls like that. So every hit that you achieve at least does some damage, which makes it not quite as miserable. All right. Um, after a round of combat, First the Japanese, then the American gets to choose whether or not to withdraw from combat. And if they withdraw, they separate their withdrawing forces, which is all of them, into different stacks. All the air units that they have go home. Their other units, though, are separated into groups. And then the pursuing player has the option to send his forces after them. He can, uh, he can split up his forces to chase specific groups, and these can be split again and again as different rounds of pursuit go on. The only proviso there is he has to have at least as high a speed rating, including all damage effects, as any of the ships, that, as the slowest ship in the force that he's chasing. And then they just keep continuing fighting with the uh, withdrawing player flipped over so that he can't affect control of the area. All right. Uh, and though, again, you check for night and day battles and all that in each of these different little pulse things. Now, ships that pursue cannot do an air raid. And that's one reason maybe not to pursue, although air raids are uncommon. An air raid is an attempt to hit ships in a port. If there's ships uh, stationed in a port, you can airstrike them for two rounds using the air raid procedure, and you can also hit ground units in the port, although they're a little bit more defended. Oh. All right, uh, there's repair factors. The Japanese get six repair factors each turn here. If a ship doesn't do anything for a turn, it can repair, you can repair that many points of ships there. The English get one in Ceylon, and the U.S. gets a variable amount over in Pearl Harbor. I see uh, three points on turn two. I think they have less on turn one. It goes up to 15 points on turn six and then remains there. If the U.S. loses Pearl Harbor, in that unlikely circumstance, uh, they can switch those points to Samoa. If they lose both, they're out of luck, and all the others are singular. I think that's actually, yeah, I missed, uh, Australia has one as well that I missed. Okay. So, the first turn is where everything gets exciting and special, though. And those special rules comprise the surprise attack situation. The Japanese are able to grab some faster ships. I think they have to, I don't remember what the speed is, it may be seven that they're allowed to dispatch to Pearl Harbor. I don't want to look it up. Um, they put them in that Pearl Harbor raid box or whatever. Their other ships move normally. And then you start a combat round. Now, normally they couldn't reach Pearl Harbor, okay? Uh, if they were stationed at Truck, yeah, they could raid Pearl Harbor. There's other games where they can't. Yeah, so they could make it there, but, uh, his, but in the game they're actually based at Yokosuka, and that's actually too far for them to make it. No, 
One, two, three. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Um, so the special Pearl Harbor raid is going to be two rounds of air con of air raid against the ships here. The two cruisers here don't count. After those two rounds, the Japanese have the choice to withdraw. If they don't withdraw, whatever's left that floats comes out of Pearl Harbor. Then the U.S. has the option to retreat from uh, the Hawaiian Islands area. And if they do so, the Japanese can't pursue, but the Japanese then get the right to do two more rounds of air attacks on uh, Pearl. If, on the other hand, they stay and fight, there's still only two rounds of, of combat to happen, the, and uh, it's handled normally in the basic game, and then the Japanese get to break off. Now, when they break off after their two rounds, the Americans can pursue them under all the normal rules for pursuit there, so the battle can continue. It's only two rounds total. If the first round is a naval combat and then the Americans withdraw, the Japanese can pursue them for one more round, or they can air raid for one round, but they're limited by their fuel to that, even though normally they wouldn't be under those circumstances. Uh, now, after the Hawaiian Islands attack, there's an air raid in Indonesia. It's in the f uh, fleets in Indonesia. It's treated as a normal air raid even though they're at sea. Uh, the difference being so when you're in air raiding something in port the ships can actually take double the damage because they fall down to the bottom of the harbor and you could dredge them up and repair them that way. They'll be destroyed if you end up uh, invading the island or taking control of it. Speaking of damage, the other thing that happens damage-wise Air units and uh, marines just go onto the turn record track two turns later and they'll be placed in one of these little boxes uh, when they're destroyed. Ships, of course, are permanently de destroyed. Um, so the Indonesia attack is two round air raid attack. The ships aren't in port. And after, I believe the air unit there may be able to fight. Maybe not. No, no. Okay, and after that air raid of two rounds, then any Allied units get to fight normally if they're still there. Okay, there's a bunch of optional rules for the game and a bunch of expansions that came out in, you know, expanded rules and homemade variants too uh, that have come out over the years, some of them in the general. That's why I have some handcrafted stuff there. So the expansions, I'm definitely going to, I think I'm going to try playing with all of them. I've never played with all of them before, but what the hell. Uh, the first one's the nine turn game. I played with this quite often. This expands the length of time for the game. Because that's sort of an, a U.S. advantage, the ninth turn is going to generate lots of points for the U.S. They're going to have uh, Japan pretty much down to the islands at that point. They give a bonus of, what, one victory point? Somewhere. One extra uh, point of control each turn that the Japanese control the Japanese islands, and one extra point of control each turn they control Indonesia. So they get an extra bunch of points early in the game. Sometimes I've seen this actually favor the Japanese quite a bit, <laughs> but no matter what, those extra points are probably tilting the game a little bit in the favor of the Japanese. The Japanese also get some other advantages here. Uh, kamikaze attacks. They're allowed to make kamikaze attacks and they can use air units or aircraft carriers as though they have the plus one bonus. Now, this is only on turn nine and it will automatically eliminate whatever units make that attack. Uh, Special rules for Pearl Harbor, limiting the amount of Japanese ships that are there. Uh, bonuses to the first round shot at Pearl Harbor for the Japanese, but the 7th Air Force is allowed to come out and attack Japanese carriers or whatever in the second round, if it's still there. 
This is in the midst of the air raid. Uh, if the Japanese stick around after the air raid, it's going to be a day battle immediately afterwards. And the Japanese have to secretly allocate what they're attacking in that first round after uh, of, of, of battle. And that secret allocation is not only Pearl Harbor and the ships that are in the Hawaiian Islands, which could retreat and then are no longer targets, actually, but it could also be the random determined and this isn't part of the optional, I just didn't cover it, the randomly determined uh, task forces that are basically the carrier forces that the Americans had out that the Japanese expect, expected to hit some of in Pearl Harbor and were not there. They will never be there in this game. Um, okay. Other effects. Gunnery radar. Starting turn 7, the U.S. ships with gunnery factors of 3 or higher will get the attack bonus, the circle, the white circle, on their uh, guns so that they're even better at uh, the night battles. Damage control. A uh, few ships, the British 027 carriers and the Taiho or Shinano are considered to have armored flight decks, and they're going to get... Um, a minus one to any attacks by airstrikes, right? No, any die roll, any damage die roll against them because of their armored flight deck. And the U.S. carriers uh, with an airstrike rating of four also get a bonus because of improved damage control. The final one's the most complicated, the task forces. This one essentially takes away, uh, the game was all very abstract, hey, we're in a naval battle, we're all there. This one starts putting spotting and sighting into the game. So, in the beginning of each round of combat, you have to pick what you're doing with a group of ships. And you can split into multiple task forces in a single sea area in each round. Your choices are... Uh, landing, searching, or hiding. Okay? If you're landing, you're automatically detected. If you're searching, there's a higher chance that you'll be detected, and it, uh, one through four, and if you're hiding, you're only detected on a one or two. Now, the reason you'd land is that uh, you would you, you can't land troops unless you're, the, the force they're in is landing. If you're, uh, why would you search? That's a good question. You add one to the search. You add one to each die roll if you control the area. You have a better chance of, uh, of hiding that way. Uh, so during a day action, if you are hiding, you can't attack. And you can only attack sighted task forces. That's why you wouldn't want to be hiding. Um, a hiding task force that is sighted can be attacked, but cannot attack. Uh, during a night action, if you're hiding and unsighted, you cannot attack and cannot be attacked. But if you're either searching, landing, or sighted, you can attack and be attacked. So, basically what happens there is if you are hiding and unsighted, you're out of the battle. And if one person's entire force is hiding and unsighting, unsighted, they are ignored in a night battle. But the more interesting thing is the day battles for that. Um, and amphibious units can only land if they're in a landing force, which normally you wouldn't pick unless you were performing a landing. All right, briefer, uh, somewhat less profane, and more to the point, I think, although it misses some of my rambling in there, I'm sure. All right, up it goes.